Well, as the title says, this is less about Abu Dhabi and more about 2021 as a whole, F1 speaking, of course. Uh, and I thought it might be quite interesting because everybody out there just been so brilliant uh, towards this channel to have a look at some of the comments and questions you've asked over the past couple of months. By no means is this all embracing, but it is just a few and we'll be doing a few more of these uh, during the winter as well. So with no more ado, let's start with uh, the first comment. Um, well, it's a question actually. It comes in from Flamma28, Italian maybe? Hi Peter. Why did Formula One suddenly bring in the stiffer rear tyre mid-season? It seemed to favour Mercedes. Well, yeah, I mean, we did go on about that a lot. And, and I don't know how many other people mentioned that at the time. But to me, uh, Mercedes in the first half of the year definitely did not have the same aerodynamic downforce efficiency and therefore downforce for the same drag as Red Bull. And that's effectively where Max did win the championship. I mean, all credit to, to Adrian Newey and his team and for Max for maximising the car at that time of the year. Um, and I think that was because they, they, you know, they just, it was the final rendition, wasn't it, of the, of the high rate car that Adrian pioneered in, in this era of Formula One. Brilliant, brilliant man, Adrian. And Mercedes never went that route. They never had the same downforce efficiency as Red Bull. But I think that when the stiffer rear came in, it did give them a more stable platform at the rear to control the air at the back of the car as best they could. And it definitely gave them a help. I don't think it helped Red Bull because I think they were there already, but I think it helped Mercedes. Why did Formula One allow that to happen? Well, if you remember at Baku, there were tire failures and that Max should have won Baku. And in reality, you know, he should have won the world championship purely because of that race. I mean, had he finished that race, he would have been world champion probably before Abu Dhabi. Equally, if Lewis's brake thing hadn't uh, messed up or he hadn't messed it up, whatever he did at the beginning of that final sprint, you know, it would have been a different story as well. Uh, but anyway, we had those tyre failures. It was um, Lance Stroll and Max Verstappen in that race. And already by then, Pirelli knew that their tyres were not strong enough. They'd, they'd realised that over the winter, but it took them that long to get them on stream for all the teams to get a proper supply of the new stiffer rear. And that happened for Silverstone. I think if Pirelli had been able to have them available for the start of the year, they would have. But I think Silverstone was the point at which they knew they could do the entire field. And that's a function of Formula One working with a tyre company in monopoly. When it's in monopoly, the tyre company quite logically doesn't want to spend more than it needs to on development and production. It will spend quite a lot on marketing because they've got to tell a story out there. But in terms of getting things done, perhaps as quickly as Bridgestone or Michelin or even Goodyear would have done it, yeah, probably we're a bit behind the eight ball now. But that's, you know, that's a function of Formula One life. If, if, uh, if Formula One, by which I say, you know, Ferrari, Ross Braun at the time, hadn't kicked Michelin into touch uh, when they did, I think it was 06, uh, by, by actually accusing Michelin of flagrantly breaching the technical regulations with their so-called twin compound tread edges. Uh, if that hadn't happened, Michelin might be in Formula One now, who knows? But, and if it was, it'd be a different situation, but they're not, and that happened. And so therefore, you know, we have to live with what we have. Okay, next question, Rufo Kolaiko, another cool name. Uh, hi, Peter, the drive for big money isn't gonna generate more technical innovation. The opposite is true. Times change, but not always for the better. Well, I think what you're saying there, Rufo, is that technical change is a good thing, and we may not be having very much of that these days, innovation that is, uh, and it's all drive for big money that's causing that. It's drive for big money, but I've also made this point several times, but I'll, I'll make it again because I'm a firm believer in it. I think a lot of the changes we make to Formula One are unnecessary, and they're based on surveys massively expensive surveys, some company out there has been paid a fortune to put them together. And surveys to me, they're the bane of my life because they, they're they only as good as the questions you ask. And nine, not even nine times out of 10, it's 99.9% .9 of the time, the question is loaded towards the answer that the survey owner wants to wants to achieve. And so, and just to put it in a nutshell, if, if any given, any self-respecting Formula One race fan is given uh, two questions. One, one is Formula One is known for its um, for its boring racing. There's not much overtaking. Would you like to see more overtaking in the future? Would you attend more races? Would you watch more of it on TV? What, are the, what is the fan going to say? Of course, he's going to say yes. If, however, the question was loaded this way, if having more overtaking in Formula One meant that 
most of the cars would all be the same, that there would be not much difference anymore between a Ferrari and a Mercedes and a Red Bull, and they would be indistinguishable technically, and there would be very little technical innovation on the cars, and the cars themselves and the technology would be quite boring. In fact, we might as well all run the same chassis. Do you still want more overtaking? Quite a lot of people might say, no, I want a Ferrari to be a Ferrari, and I want a Mercedes to be a Mercedes. It's, it's, it's how you ask the question. And, and, and so I think one of the reasons we're in this situation now where we don't have a lot of technical innovation is not because of the search for big money. It's for the search for, well, it is indirectly, it's the search for the show. The show's got to be better. And there's this belief, quite naive in some ways, that more overtaking equals a better show. And as we saw, particularly at the US Grand Prix this year, that isn't necessarily the case. If it's well uh, cast and it's well directed and well produced, a Formula One race can be devastatingly exciting without any overtaking, providing you understand what everybody's doing and how it's working and what they're doing to make the positions as they are. We should have the driver's briefings or the team briefings, one per race, that should be reality TV, GoPros in the debriefing room, obviously censored. It goes, it doesn't have to be live, but it can be censored. Take out a few words that are going to be secret for the team. But nonetheless, we should get access to the fans, we should get access to what it's like in one of those briefing meetings. We should see the driver's briefing on the Saturday night after qualifying when the race director's talking to all the drivers. I mean, that was in the Senna movie. Why don't we have it now? And, and so on. There's so much stuff out there. We should maybe have GoPros in the road cars of selected teams per race, where we see what's the conversation is, is they're driving back to the hotel at night. And that doesn't impinge on COVID bubbles or anything else. It's just great TV, but it's not happening. It's better than it was, but it's by no means where we could be if we really went for it. And so to me, those are things that we could add straight away without touching the cars, the qualifying format, the race format, all those things that they keep playing with, leave them alone. Let's just work on the quality of the show. Anyway, th I didn't really answer your question, Rufa, but thank you very much for the train of thought. Um, this is from Vessel van Dieren. Uh, hi, Peter. Why does everybody want Formula One to become big in the USA? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think because America's a huge country and they like their motorsport and Formula One <clears throat> has got quite a big... US history. You know, if you go back to Phil Hill winning the World Championship 61, obviously Mario Andretti in 78. And so it goes on. Dan Gurney, fabulous racing driver, built probably the nicest Grand Prix car of all time, the Eagle Westlake. Uh, yeah, why wouldn't we want America? I think, you know, the two things here, and this is another point I've made, but I'll, re I'll make it again. I don't believe that the secret for getting a country to absorb Formula One is to have a race or lots of races in that country. That's part of it. But I think having drivers from that country competing in Formula One at the highest level is a much easier and logical solution. And again, I'm sorry, I keep saying this, but if you had an Indian driver in a Red Bull and if you had an American in a Ferrari, you don't think there would be more interest in Formula One in India and the United States? Of course there would be. And actually putting together a young driver program for all those countries focused entirely on Formula One reality TV on Netflix isn't anything like as expensive as trying to put on a Grand Prix in that country. And I don't know why they haven't done that. I mean, I've gone on and on about that, but I'm going on about it again. And I actually did a dossier, it was about this thick, to Liberty a couple of years ago about how they could easily do a young driver program in all the key continents of the world to try over a four to five year period to get drivers, the best drivers from those continents into Formula One. And they just said, yeah, it's great, but it all looks very difficult. Let's not do it. <laughs> so they didn't do it. I don't know. You know, to me, yeah, of course, America uh, is important to Formula One, but so are other continents. And we do have a young American who's kind of doing, I mean, Logan Sargent's really good, I think. And he's in Formula Two in 2022, but he didn't have a great 2021. And Formula One people have such a short attention span to young drivers. I mean, he had a great 2020 went off the boil in 2021 and nobody was talking about Paul Logan. You know, it was just him in a different team. But that's what it's like in F3. Up, down, the team, the cars are incredibly not difficult to drive. They just have much more grip than they have power, which is always a difficult thing. So, um, yeah, it's him. And then you've got young Max Esterton, who looked really good, young American who won the Walter Hayes Formula Ford Festival and has actually come into motorsport from, from sim racing but chose to come in, in Formula Ford 1600 in the UK. And I think that's really impressive that he would do that. Just wants to slide the car around, get, get used to 
car control without downforce before he gets into the next thing. He's doing GB3 this year. So yeah, lots to talk about with America. We'll come back to that one, I guess.